What is going on, everyone? Welcome to the Week 18 NFL Power Rankings show. Obviously, a bit of a different tone here with this one, uh, with the DeMar Hamlin situation. Um, You know, we didn't put this video out yesterday. It, It just was not right. Not just out of respect to him and his family, and that is priority number one and even as I just sit down and think and talk about football it's just tough like I'm only every time I I think about like oh Justin Herbert played this well or uh like oh wow the Packers are in the playoffs it's like DeMar Hamlin just keeps creeping back into my mind and that's a big reason I didn't record yesterday it just obviously out of respect for him and his family like I want the attention to be on him but also like and this is way less significant, but like it was just a shell shocking thing. I wasn't personally ready to talk about football. Um, I couldn't sit down. It's still tough today, but I've just been in a weird headspace. I still kind of am. So I don't know if I'm making any sense here, but obviously we hope DeMar is going to be okay. We continue to check the updates on the situation I'm sure I'm like the rest of you, just like constantly looking for good news. So uh, here's hoping for that and get well soon, Damar. We are going to talk about some football here today, but um, I do want to give just some channel updates here as we head into the new year. And if you don't care, just skip forward like two minutes, but I need a platform to kind of update you guys that are the regular listeners. And this video seems like the right time to do it. Um, so this is going to be my only video this week. We are finally going to get down to Illinois to celebrate Christmas with my wife's family. It has just been a wild couple of weeks in general. We had a big snowstorm that made it so we couldn't get down to see her family for Christmas. Then we get COVID here during Christmas. So we're quarantined all of last week. Then this weekend, the DeMar Hamlin thing happens and another snowstorm. So it's just been a wild couple of weeks, been in a weird headspace. Um, But yes, no more content this week. But on Monday next week, we'll be firing out the gate with my playoff predictions show. And really excited to just kind of have a few days off, clear my head, start scouting some college prospects And then we're going to get into the playoff predictions and we're going to very quickly be transitioning into draft content here on the channel, which I think those that have been around will agree is the best time of the year here on that franchise, guys. So I am looking forward to what's coming. I wanted to give an update there. And then the last thing here is these power rankings here are going to double as this week's podcast. The, you know, having to take the day yesterday has set us back and then we're leaving tomorrow. So um, we're going to include this in this week's episode of the Fully Inflated Football Podcast. Make sure you guys are checking that out. If you didn't know, I have a podcast. Those links are in the description down below. Uh, But yeah, we're going to make this the main topic of the week's show. And then I will add on the Patreon mailbag at the end of that episode of the podcast. So there's your channel updates. And let's get into it. Thank you for hearing me out. So Starting at the bottom of the final week's power rankings, we have the Indianapolis Colts. They get dominated by the Giants this week. This team kind of seems to have given up in a lot of ways. The offense is, to me, where you look and say, holy crap, that's bad. Going to Nick Foles was just always weird. I feel bad for Matt Ryan at this point. But in general, we're running out of things to say about the Colts, who unfortunately will find themselves probably as the worst team in football at the end of the season without the number one overall pick. And maybe that stings a little bit more as the Houston Texans happily lose this week. It was really starting to feel like the Texans were going to botch this thing. They were starting to play really competitive. The Bears have not been in a whole lot of football games And they were like a game out of losing that number one pick, which I think would set this team back big time. Something I have detailed on the podcast over the last couple of weeks, but uh, a big loss in a good way for the Texans. But that scrappy team from weeks 15, 16, not so much there this week with the Houston Texans getting just steamrolled by the Jags who got to pull their starters by the third quarter in this game. Then the Chicago Bears. 
at number 30, that defense is a laughing stock. It really is. It is, in my opinion, the worst front seven I've seen in 10 years of watching the NFL. And that was intentional, uh, but it's tough to watch. And the Detroit Lions took advantage of that this week. And there's only so much Justin Fields can do uh, to keep them competitive. Then the Denver Broncos, plus two, showing some fight in their big ding-dong, the witch is dead week. For Denver, if they can just play competitive, I mean, losing by three to the Chiefs is definitely a, um emotional, uplifting loss in a way. For me, for Denver, it's all about appealing to a new head coach this week, seeing Russ look like a guy that can be a top 10 quarterback again. I have said that it's not full on doom and doom and gloom with Denver. Like a lot of people have said, I think there's still a chance they can turn this thing around. There's still a lot of talent on that team. And uh, as bad as Russ has looked, I'm not going to fully count him out for next season. Uh, but it it certainly is. I'm not trying to paint rainbows and butterflies either. It's it's a very fascinating situation. But hey, they competed this week and looked okay on on both sides of the ball. Honestly, considering they were going against the Chiefs, then the L.A. Rams going to drop down one, getting dominated by the Chargers this week. That's a team that's just unwatchable uh, and difficult to analyze until we get to next year. It's all about uh, getting healthy and trying to run this thing back for next season. Then the Arizona Cardinals at 27. I will admit they are showing more mental toughness and resiliency than I would have expected. I mean, they lose on a game-ending field goal in Atlanta with David Blau at quarterback. I want to give a tip of the cap to their defensive coordinator, Van Joseph. I think he's done a really good job this year with a defensive roster that you look at it on paper. And coming into the year, I thought it was maybe the worst in the league, Uh, certainly bottom three. And... I'm just impressed with how they're fighting. Fight is not something I've used to describe the Arizona Cardinals, um, but obviously a a tough year in Arizona. So there are your cellar dwellers. And then we have one team alone in our tier two here, the consistently inconsistent tier. And that is, I think, the perfect way to describe the Atlanta Falcons, who have been more or less the same team all season long. Now, I think it's really good that they, the last couple weeks, have really found something in Tyler Algier. Really liked him coming out. Just so tough. Kind of like a a more creative version of Jamal Williams coming out of BYU. He's a really good player. And they're going to really lean into him next year, especially considering how much they want to run the ball. And Drake London's looked really good. But the, the Falcons just, it's not so much that I throw my hands up and I'm like, I don't know what to say about them. But it is kind of like that way. They just are in such a weird point in their franchise. And ever since they drafted Desmond Ritter, I said it on draft night. I said it when I graded their draft. Like That pick just confused the crap out of me because it didn't really make sense with where they're at in their timeline. You draft this high floor, low upside quarterback in the third round for a team that probably wasn't going to be any good this year that you would think wants to be in the quarterback conversations for the draft this year. Um, It just doesn't make sense to take a guy that we kind of knew would probably come in at some point, play fine, but probably not blow you away to the point where you feel like he's the future. And they're just going to have some really weird conversations heading into the third year of Arthur Smith's regime where he hasn't done a whole lot of winning they've done a whole lot of average but how are they going to take that next step next year it's going to be really fascinating to see kind of internally how they because you don't get to be a coach in the NFL. you can't be an average coach in the nfl forever and i think arthur smith understands that so it's going to be very fascinating to see kind of what steps he takes like are they a sneaky Derek carr team i i just don't know does matt ryan come back i don't know i'm very curious to see where the Falcons go from here. And I I do think they're in a tier of their own because being out of playoff contention is nothing new for them. They've admitted that when they turned the keys to Desmond Ritter. And that takes me to our third tier here. And this is the tier. Thank you, Gandalf. And the Tennessee Titans are in here. But pretty self-explanatory there. These are teams that have been eliminated from the playoffs and the Tennessee Titans. 
And with this tier, it's going to be my conversations on them is going to be much more focused on the offseason. And maybe this can act as a bit of a, a podcast hybrid section here. Because trying to rank these teams, 25 through 19, teams that are eliminated, that have theoretically nothing to play for, that could be playing backups or benching quarterbacks or resting players that may be playing injured, trying to do what I normally do and say, if these guys played this Sunday on a neutral field, where would I stack them up as far as who's going to win? That's normally my criteria for these power rankings. But in this tier... I, I guess I tried to do that, but my conversation is going to be much more about what's next. And this tier is actually going to start with the Washington Commanders. Now, really rough week. They go to Carson Wentz, and honestly, I said they should go to Carson Wentz because a lot of the talk this week is that was a horrible decision. They were winning with Taylor Heineke. No, they weren't. They were winning with great defense. That's a recency bias thing to say this was all Carson Wentz's fault because they played the New York Giants a couple weeks ago. Taylor Heineke played like crap, coughed the ball up a couple times, and they lost because of those turnovers. So that forced them to make a quarterback change after more turnovers against the Niners. I I understand why they went to Wentz. Um, He was the higher upside play. Even if his floor was maybe slightly lower, they weren't winning that game with Taylor Heineke either. Like... They have some issues, man. They did not play as well defensively as they should have against a Browns offense that had really struggled. And the offensive line uh, can't take care of business right now. So they're not a good football team right now. They definitely bottomed out after some good, tough wins there in that middle streak. But um, where do they go from here? I... (laughs) I think Rivera's probably back. I wouldn't be stunned if they fired him. If new ownership comes in and just kind of goes to a new head coach, and I I suppose that's maybe 50-50 at this point in time, but very clearly this is a good roster that just needs a new quarterback, and I think this is an obvious Derek Carr destination. I think, in my mind, they are the favorite just schematically, with the way that team is constructed, he makes a ton of sense as a guy. You put him in there, you add another piece in the secondary, and all of a sudden, this can be a really freaking good team, a team that can honestly be in the mix in the NFC East that is looking like a very good division for next year. So I'm not going to say it's all doom and gloom. It's just going to be about finding that quarterback and potentially a new ownership and coaching structure. But for now... A really disappointing end to the commander season. Uh, then the Tennessee Titans at 24. I I almost said on by this week because that's basically what it was. They sat everybody. I'm not going to look into their game against the Cowboys on Thursday night. If anything, they they competed their ass off uh, and and fought in in the way that that Mike Vrabel's teams tend to do. And if that results in them upsetting the Jags and sneaking into the playoffs, that's great. They would do it as an eight and nine football team in a horrible division. So, like, I'm not going to apologize about ranking them 24th. What we've seen from the Titans in the last five weeks or so, it's been a bad football team. It really has. They Tannehill goes down. They can't really pass the ball. Malik Willis, not ready. Josh Dobbs is fun. I like his aggressiveness on Thursday Night Football, but is he going to play winning football? I doubt it. Their offensive line is terrible from a pass protection standpoint. They're incredibly beat up defensively. You know, the injuries have just become too much for this team. So we'll see what they do against the Jags. But this was always going to be a transition season for the Titans. I've seen some panic from Titans fans. Um, You know, you you outperformed your expectations there for a stretch. And I think Mike Vrabel deserves some credit for that. But I I think, did I have them going 8-9 and on the season? I think I did. I, I would have to go double check that, but I, I don't think there's cause for a lot of panic here in Tennessee. You knew this was going to be a transition season, so their, their offseason probably won't be too crazy. It's just about retooling where they can and coming back next year to compete. But uh, yeah, we'll see what happens this Saturday with them. Then we got the Carolina Panthers. Their division hopes end uh, in pretty dramatic fashion. I mean, they came out the gate Looked really good against the Bucks, but the the injuries in the secondary just caught up to them. You know, 
not having J.C. Horn out there was a huge impact for them. When you think about this game, it really was a couple of Sam Darnold fumbles, and I, I think it was uh, Taylor, right? The Washington kid was was it him that kept getting beat by Mike Evans? I'd have to rewatch, but three huge Mike Evans touchdowns were the difference in this game. Three throws from Tom Brady, dimes, and uh, they lose. Like this week was a huge reminder of getting healthy at the end of the season. I'm not going to say it's all that matters, but my God, it makes a difference. You lose a couple of critical players, like the Panthers lose J.C. Horn, and that's ball game. So the Panthers are an interesting spot. They're actually a relatively appealing job opening. I'm also very curious, like, can they work this thing out with Steve Wilkes to come back as their defensive coordinator? Because I think he's done a pretty good job there. I know from an ego standpoint, that typically doesn't play out that way. But I think if if David Tepper can have a conversation and find the right guy to be their head coach, this could be honestly a favorite for the NFC South next year. If they figure out their quarterback situation, it's a pretty good roster. And thank God they didn't trade away these players, DJ Moore and Brian Burns, who have been great in the last month where a lot of talking heads were saying, you got to get the picks. You got to trade these guys away. You got to blow it up. I pushed back on that. I said, hold on. These guys are young, top players at their position. All you're going to do by trading them is creating a need at critical positions that you're just going to have to hit on again. Like, no, you don't got to trade Brian Burns for a pair of future first round picks and ship off DJ Moore. Thank God they didn't, because this is an attractive offering. The, the season... Um, coach, coach position rather. Um, yeah, the, the season didn't finish the way that maybe some hopes had decided, but overall, they fought. They were in the mix, which no one thought was going to happen. They, we thought they were in contention for Bryce Young when they let Matt Rule go. So, moving on from Rule, competing, the Panthers could be in a worse spot as they head into the off season. They could be the New Orleans Saints <laughs> heading into the off season. The Saints are not a bad football team. They go to Philadelphia, they win, they show incredible physical toughness. This is what I respect about the New Orleans Saints, is they are a bunch of freaking badasses out there. From Taysom Hill, who runs harder to anybody, to their secondary, that they're just so physical, they don't back down from a challenge. Even when you see A.J. Brown pull away from them, they play with the confidence to come out and, and get a big interception from Marshawn Lattimore on like the next drive. So they have players. I think the reactions about how bad the coaching here is has been a little overstated. It's not a surprise. Anytime a team disappoints one way or another, the arrow usually gets pointed to the coaching staff immediately. You know, I look at like injuries for sure. And just the fact that this team, they're a seven and 10 football team, right? They're a seven and nine or eight and nine, seven and 10 team. We, I don't think they've underachieved. They just don't have the completeness to be a true contender. I think they've done a decent enough job. So I do think Dennis Allen is probably back. I think Carmichael is probably back. Some Saints fans might not like that, but did they do an incredible job? Like, were they as good as Brian Dable was? No. But I also don't think this was a complete disaster either. And they had some really tough, like, close losses in there as well. Uh, the Vikings game comes to mind. Honestly, both Bucks games come to mind. Like, a couple things go a different way, and this season looks a lot different. Now, they don't have their first-round pick, famously traded that to the Eagles. And thank God for them, that's not going to be, like, enough to get them Jalen Carter or Will Anderson, like it looked like it might for a little bit. Um, but... I do think for the Saints, what's most important for this offseason is to don't continue digging in this hole. You're not going to flip this thing around and become a Super Bowl team next year. I think it's important for this team that has been so ridiculously aggressive like in the last six plus years with Mickey Loomis and the, the void years and the trades, like just stop. For a second, just stop, take a step back and say, okay, we'll try and compete. Our division's probably going to suck next year. Brady's probably out of here. We'll see what happens. I'm not going to write the Saints out of winning the NFC South next year. I really am not. 
and that's fortunate for them. But let some bad contracts go. I think it's time. Can you move off of Mike? Uh, sorry, can you move off of Michael Thomas? Can you recoup some more draft picks? Get younger as a team. Maybe you bring Andy Dalton back. You do the Taysom Hill, Andy Dalton thing again, and just figure out where you're going to be with some with some picks, with some cap space. Figure out where you can be heading into a new kind of transition period. Another team that's going to be kind of fascinating to see how they play this. Because could I see the Saints? continuing to kick the can down the road and being like, oh, if we get Derek Carr and his contract, we can we can win this division. Like, totally. I can totally see the Saints continuing to be aggressive. I don't think that's the right move for them, um, but that to me is where I would be. Uh, okay, then we have the New York Jets. Obviously, quarterback, right? Like, they lose this game. Mike White plays like Zach Wilson in this game. And they lose. Like, they need a quarterback. This is an obvious Derek Carr spot. This is a potential maybe Jordan Love spot if he wants out of Green Bay. Uh, They're a potential sneaky team to trade up in the draft and be aggressive there to go and get another quarterback. That's what this is all about. You have Robert Salah in year three now, next year. Uh, or, yeah, heading into year three. He knows he's got to get things done in this New York market. They have a remarkable roster, not a whole lot of weaknesses. So that's going to be a big storyline, is who's who are the Jets going to go get at quarterback? And make sure you check out last week's episode of the uh, Fully Inflated Football Podcast, where we did a quarterback carousel. Okay, then the Cleveland Browns at 20. Deshaun Watson starting to play better, and, and that's... You know, week by week, it's getting better and better and better. They have one more week to maybe see him look like if he plays like he did in the second half of that Washington game, you feel pretty good about like, all right, we got him back to speed and we hope we can resume next year with a potential elite quarterback. And I've I've certainly not backed down from saying I am openly rooting for him to fail. I do not condone what he did. I think it's terrible and gross. But from a football perspective, he, I'm not going to say he was the reason they won that game against Washington, but, you know, was much more comfortable in structure, hitting those crossing routes that are integral parts of this offense. Uh, The play extension, I will say, looks a little bit slower. (laughs) I don't know if that's a weather thing uh, or what, but he looks a little bit slower than I remember in Houston. Maybe it's because he was in a, you know, nice stadium and warm weather. I, I don't know if that holds up like analytically, but just eye test, he doesn't seem to have that same, um, ultra juice back there to kind of escape and stuff. Still good at it, but I don't know, just an observation, uh, but a pretty straightforward off season for the Browns who don't have a uh, first round pick. And it's about, uh, trying to be a championship team next, next year. Then the, the Raiders rounding out this tier, an incredibly competitive game against the Niners. Jarrett Stidham plays outstanding, and that's fascinating, right? Because Stidham was a five-star quarterback prospect. He was kind of in and out of first-round conversations in his time at Auburn, but just was never consistent enough. At a time, I felt like like I was watching a little bit of Tony Romo when I was doing his eval back at Auburn, but the inconsistency was just too much to overcome. And that's where this creeps into your mind, right? Like we've seen flashes from Jarrett Stidham and certainly this was a high point game for him, but we have no way of knowing that he can play like that again. So no, Jarrett Stidham is not your, your, your go-to quarterback for next year. You keep him on the roster you can have him compete with a rookie or whatever, have him a part of the picture. But no, even whatever he does this week, week 18, it, it's not going to solidify him as the week one starter for the Raiders. That idea is ridiculous, but he did play well. He has traits. He's a fascinating player. Uh, but the Raiders just have a lot of work to do. What can they get for Derek Carr? Look, I, I wouldn't be surprised if they get a first round pick for Derek Carr. You have a couple teams kind of in the middle there with Washington, the Jets, maybe Carolina, like there's going to be a market for Derek Carr and that price might become a first round pick and that'd be huge for the Raiders. That's a starting lineman or a starting pass rusher or a starting corner. So that's what they need. They need depth at critical positions and that's what their offseason is going to be about. And uh, obviously 
the quarterback situation will be interesting to monitor as well. Is this a Tom Brady destination? Is this a CJ Stroud destination? I, I don't know. But obviously spent a lot of time there because this is a podcast hybrid where we typically talk about every team. And I wanted to be a little bit different there with that group. Let me interrupt the video real quick to tell you about my friends at Underdog Fantasy. Underdog has gotten me right back into daily fantasy. And I'm sure you guys have all seen the screenshots going around of people enjoying their daily pick 'em contests. At Underdog, you're only competing against yourself, unlike the salary cap leagues where you have to beat out thousands and thousands of people. Well, on Underdog, you are just picking two to five player props, anything from over-under receiving yards, interceptions, fantasy points, and you're parlaying them together. You can also buy insurance so that you're allowed to miss on one of your picks, and the payouts are huge. If you go five out of five, that is 20 to one. Buy insurance, that's 10 to one. So you can put two, three, four, five dollars on any one of these given bets, and the payouts are outstanding. So even if you don't win, it feels like you're winning because it increases your interest in any given football game. I have loved playing on Underdog Fantasy. I think you guys are too. And now if you sign up using promo code TFG, they will match up to $100 on your first deposit. That's promo code TFG at Underdog Fantasy. But now we're going to get back more into this season um, and the playoffs and how good these teams are now. And these are the 18 teams still in, still alive, still in consideration for this season. And that starts to me with the Miami Dolphins who feel out of it at this point. They, to me, are definitely the worst team at this point in time of these remaining teams down to Skylar Thompson at quarterback. That is considered, obviously, if they had to, uh, they'd be much higher, but He's a limited player. I, I think the the arm talent with him is just a concern, not just um, vertically, but when he's on the move, he's just not very accurate. And you got to be accurate in this offense. You got to be able to just give these receivers a chance, and he's not been able to do that. And Teddy Bridgewater, I think, has played fine, but the poor guy is built like from straw. He, the second he gets hit, like he gets face mask and his neck snaps back and they have to pull him out of the game because they're concerned about like structural damage. So that's what it is with the Dolphins. And I think they lose and I don't think they go to the playoffs. So it, it is just, it's a reminder. Injuries and staying healthy late into the season, so important, especially when you talk about that quarterback position. They're down to the third string and they're not able to do what the Niners have done with uh, a third-string quarterback because their third-string quarterback's not as good as Brock Purdy. But well, they could still potentially sneak in. It's not a horrible football team. I think this 18th ranking is genuine. Like, they have incredible playmakers. They have guys defensively that can make plays. They can still definitely beat the Jets, and if things fall the right way, they can still get in, right? And if they do, can you get Tua back out there? I'm not saying they should do that as far as the concussion goes, but it's not out of the realm of possibilities for the Dolphins to get in, for Tua to be starting, or even for Teddy to be starting, and them to be a really tough out in the playoffs. But with Skylar Thompson against a real playoff team, uh-uh. Then the Pittsburgh Steelers at 17. God, this is just a Mike Tomlin dedicated segment. He is likely now, I don't want to say likely, but in a good position now, to keep his streak alive, the streak I'm referencing, the man has never had a losing season in the NFL. He's been coaching since 2000 fucking seven. That's unbelievable. That's got to be one of the most impressive. Like that tops Brett Favre's start streak. I think that's right behind like Tom Brady's Super Bowl rings for like just ridiculous career accomplishments, especially in this season. I think we had them ranked as low as 29th. They have a rookie quarterback. They had just moved off of Trubisky. Their best player goes down, TJ Watt. Their team was in shambles, and they have salvaged a season out of this. And you look at their game plan against the Ravens, excellent defensive game planning to force Huntley and that offense to beat them through the air. They couldn't do it. And shout out to Kenny Pickett 
who I want to I want to raise my hand and say I'm proud to say that in a world where pretty much everybody was throwing C's, D's, and F's at the Pittsburgh Steelers, mostly D's and F's for that pick of Kenny Pickett, I gave it, I think I gave it a B, if not a B plus. I'd have to go back and check, but I was like not dogging them for the Pickett selection. He was my number one quarterback by grade. Even though I said I probably would have taken Willis because I just want to swing for the upside, but I at least understood the process of this is similar to when the Patriots took Mac Jones. You hope you can put players around him, play great defense, have a quarterback that can run the ship, make some clutch plays like he did at Pittsburgh, and just kind of see what happens on a rookie contract. Like I fully understood that process. I didn't think he was a horrible quarterback. In fact, I liked a lot of the stuff he did. And I'm not saying the dude's the next Mahomes, but with the 20th pick in the draft, I think they've found an adequate quarterback there in Kenny Pickett. So a, a, a tip of the cap to Kenny Pickett as well here. This team is so clearly better off with him than Mitch Trubisky. So, yeah, the Steelers are afloat. I, I wouldn't be stunned. The, the series of events that they need, I think they just need the Bills to beat the Patriots and then the Jets to beat the Dolphins and they're in. I think... That's what they need. I, I didn't run through all the scenarios, but they might be in. Now, they're not going to go anywhere in a loaded AFC, but just to get in is is remarkable. Then the Seattle Seahawks at 16, a big win over the Jets. Now, they are not dead. They very much are not dead. The Seahawks just need the Lions to beat the Packers, basically, because the Seahawks get to play the Rams this week. I think they're going to win that. And just so good for, I'm just mostly happy for Geno, who had had a couple a couple of rough weeks. They were on a losing streak, comes out and plays a great game. And I just, how can you not pull for Geno Smith to get the bag, really? I mean, obviously you want him to have a cool career and maybe have this Kurt Warner-esque run. That's probably a little over the top. But for him to get generational wealth, from this season would be really cool to see. I mean, a franchise tag or a two or three year extension is very much in play for him. If you can finish strong against the Rams, sneak into the playoffs, it's been an overall feel good story for the Seahawks would be cool if they got in. I think ultimately their defense, um, and I don't, I don't want to say lack of talent offensively, but they are just a little bit behind the eight ball on that, that side. I think, um, just with some of the turnovers and they just have certain spots on the O line and some of their receiver depth that's just not quite there yet. Um, but I think ultimately defensively is what would hold them back in the playoffs. But they're very much alive and uh, could get in here. Then we got the New England Patriots at 15. I'm I've just been overall impressed by their defense. You know, offensively they just kind of do what they do. They try to nickel and dime and and skirt down the field and put up as many points as possible. I know it sounds dumb, but every team's obviously trying to score as many points as possible, but they're good for like, I don't know, somewhere between 17 and 20 points a game. They're not useless offensively, but they're certainly not explosive or well-coached offensively. But defensively, man, the Patriots have quietly brought in like a top three pass rush in the NFL. Seriously, you have... I mean, Matt Judon at this point is their third best pass rusher. Five, six weeks ago, he was their best. And he's really good. He he was halfway through the year like a defensive player of the year candidate. So he's really good. But Josh Uche has burst onto the scene. Literally, the juice he has, the athleticism, the speed, the bend, the quickness as a rusher. He's their best guy. He's unreal. Another five or six pressures this week. And then... Um, Christian Barmore's back. I freaking love Christian Barmore. That dude popped at an incredible level as a rookie. Like he is, I compared him to Jarrell Casey coming out. He has been that really since he's been playing. So that's a legit group, man. Not to mention what, what, um, I almost said Lawrence guy, Dietrich Wise has done. He's been a really good piece and you have Bill Belichick now stunting literally running, schemed up, cross stunts, and slants more than anybody in the league. They do some really fun stuff. You got Kyle Duggar on the back end. They got a bunch of fun playmakers. 
I just I I love Bill Belichick. I love seeing him kind of get his just get some get that talent back, that talent base defensively. They've had a bunch of average players, but now they got like legit dudes. Judon was the first step. Uche, Barmore, Duggar seems to have he's playing with an unbelievable level of confidence. Uh, you got some guys in the secondary, some young guys with some more athleticism making plays. So th- they're a real team, the Patriots. And even if their offense has funny storylines and Mac Jones is screaming f bombs, and you got Matt Patricia trying to design the offense, yeah, that's obviously a limiting factor for them. But you're talking about a Bill Belichick coach defense. We've seen this. You know, think about the. I think it was whatever year they played the Titans in the first round, and they were like five or six point underdogs. I think I remember I was in Seattle watching this game at Buckley's Bar. Shout out to uh, people in Seattle who know the spot I'm talking about. But um, yeah, I remember watching that game. Super fun game. You had um, Belichick just put on a show defensively, and they they knocked the Titans out, right? Um, or at least were. I don't even remember how that game ended, but I know it was like 17 to 16 or something crazy, but like that could be the Patriots this year. Could they go and, you know, upset really anybody? Yeah, I think so. Go on a a four week stretch. Probably not, but um, then we have the Baltimore Ravens, very similar, honestly, and they're in a tough spot because we just don't know where Lamar is at. And it's starting to feel more and more possible that he's not going to be ready for the playoffs and it's just going to be so hard for this team to win without him. They have a select game plan that they're going to go with. And obviously the Pittsburgh Steelers knew that. They said, you can't beat us through the air. You don't have the receivers. You don't have the scheme. And you don't have the quarterback to beat us that way. So if you have a physical defense that runs into them, they're just not going to have a lot of offensive, a whole lot of offensive output. Now, defensively, they're flying around. They're Super fun to watch on that side of the ball. I love what they do in the secondary. Uh, Obviously, those linebackers are playing, I I would say, the most explosive brand of football in the league. I I still will take the consistency of what's going on in San Francisco, but the playmaking ability of those guys is is special with Roquan and and Patrick Queen. So they're going to stay alive. And if they have Lamar to make plays for them, that's a game changer. But with the way the offense is currently set up it's it's just so limited then we have the tampa bay bucks moving up three this week and this is just kind of the whole nfc's fear is that none of this was going to (laughs) matter for the bucks the slow start the agonizing moments the lack of consistency well all of a sudden it's looking like brady's Brady, best game of the year by him. I mean, you could see all year long, people think I'm this just diehard Brady hater. Yes, I think he's the luckiest professional athlete of all time, but he's clearly an incredible quarterback. And um, this year, at no point have I said he's washed or that he's going to retire or that his physical abilities have dropped off or that even that he's playing poorly. It's been all about like the guys around him not playing well. But we know what Brady can do. We know what Brady can freaking do. We've seen it all the time, and here we are. It's week 18. He looks ready to go, and they have Donovan Smith. Ryan Jensen all of a sudden is back. I didn't know that was a possibility. And uh, (laughs) um, Tristan Wirfs is healthy again. So you get the line. You got Mike Evans playing like this. You still got Godwin. They got an offense. They definitely have a defense playing really well. Um, They're still a, a great, aggressive defense with a ton of confidence. Uh, even if they don't have Shaq Barrett, they've got Vita Vea back now. Like, you can definitely see a world where the Bucks host the Cowboys, upset them, and then, or host the Eagles, maybe without Jalen Hurts, I don't know. You know, maybe play Minnesota. Like, they can beat anybody in the NFC because they have a team that's going to keep them close and Tom Brady. Now, You still have to consider their lack of consistency throughout the season, and they definitely benefited from playing a backup secondary in Carolina this week. It's not all rainbows and butterflies, but they definitely are heating up and looking scary at the right time right now. Uh, Then the New York Giants at number 12. And 
another situation where I think Giants fans think I, I've seen, you know, I had the cave on Thibodeau tweet this week, and I do think what he did was classless. I think he looked at Nick Foles, saw him hurt, continued to celebrate, went to the bench, knowing Nick Foles was done, and did this. Like, look, I said cave on Thibodeau should have been the number one pick. I said he was edge one. I'm a I'm a Kayvon Thibodeau dude as a football player. I also think he's a dick. I, I do. I, I heard the the podcast this summer on the Around the NFL podcast. I thought it was a bad look. Um, and then this, like, I think he's a dick. It's fine. You don't need a bunch of choir boys. And people are so mad that I said it that he doesn't have a likable personality. It's fine. Like, you don't have to be a likable personality. And newsflash to all of you people on Twitter, you don't have to like all 3,000 players in the NFL. I think he's a hell of a football player, though. And besides that, I think people think I just hate the Giants. Like, I don't. I actually like the Giants. I'm a huge Brian Dable guy. I have been. Because I didn't take them all that seriously on that run. They went on a huge losing streak. And they did, for a while, look like they the, the magic had run out. But they've got the magic back. And I think they've got, like, it's not just. So when they were winning earlier in the year, it was really close games. Straight up, like, the coin landed in their favor. Granted, because they took better care of the football, they had good play calling. There was a reason that they were able to execute late in games. But they are, like, playing real football now. In my opinion, I I think this defense is much more reliable at this point with Thibodeau in the mix. Their secondary is healthier. They get McKinney back. They're a scary defense. I would not want to go against this group. They play with a ton of confidence. They're aggressive. They're opportunistic. Hell yeah. Like, that's a legit piece for the Giants. But the thing is, offensively, they're a much better team than they were when I was not taking them seriously. They just are. Daniel Jones is playing at a really good level. He's making big throws. He's taking great care of the football all season long, and to see that continue changes the way you think about him. Saquon is back healthy now, whereas it looked like maybe he had run out of steam. Their offensive line is playing better than they have all year. Oh, and Isaiah Hodgins, they actually have a second receiver to throw to now, whereas they didn't earlier on in the year. Love Isaiah Hodgins. It's like the thing I don't think people realize when they say I hate the Giants is you go back to what I said about them coming into the year. I ranked them 27th, which I think is about as high as anybody would have had them. I said they got the best head coach hire, at least in the last five years. I said people are way too down on Daniel Jones. I was criticized for how high I ranked him in that series. Saquon Barkley is one of my favorite, like, college prospects ever. He's the highest graded player I've ever had. He's one of my favorite players in the league. Isaiah Hodgins was an absolute my guy in that draft. Um Andrew Thomas was my offensive tackle one. I went I died I went to die, um I went to battle to die on the hill for Andrew Thomas. So Kayvon Thibodeau, like this team is full of guys that I love. I like the Giants a lot. I borderline love the Giants. So yeah, I didn't take you seriously earlier in the year, but I just, I had to get this out there to Giants fans that listen, I'm with you. I'm pulling for you. Let's get her done. Like, hell yeah, go beat the Vikings in the first round of the playoffs. I think they can do it at this point. They have, they have a, a real formula right now for winning meaningful football games, even more so than I think they did earlier in the year. So A tip of the cap to the Giants. Brian Dable is the runaway coach of the year, in my opinion. You know, the Niners with Shanahan and and Sirianni with the Eagles, I think are the the front runners Vegas-wise, and maybe those guys will get it. But what what Brian Dable has done with this team, how do you not vote for him for coach of the year? They They are playing in a Week 18 game where if they wanted to, they could pull their starters because it doesn't mean anything. They didn't win their division, but they're in the playoffs clinched week 18 so that was a pro giants rant for you guys i hope i won some of you back let's move on 
Um, and I realize we're getting longer with this week, but that was kind of the point, was to be kind of a podcast power rankings hybrid. Our podcasts usually go like two hours long, so here we are. Uh, all right, Minnesota Vikings at 11. Obviously a disappointing week, and not so much that they lost in Lambeau. Obviously, that doesn't feel great. It, it wasn't so much a meaningful game for the Vikings, and just the physicality that the Packers brought was notable in that game. I think that was a true, like, one team had to have it and one team didn't kind of feel for that game. But what really matters here is, number one, this team has been really anointed as a fraudulent football team, right? And fans of the teams hear that, they're like, you just called us frauds. No, there's a difference. The ex the the expectations with come that come with being an eleven and four team or whatever they are, twelve and four, whatever their record is, the expectations that come with that do not match how good this team is. The Vikings now have a point differential of Minus 19, and if it was not for 14 points of garbage time production against the backups in Green Bay, that's a negative 35-point differential for a 12-4 and football team. Just let that sink in for a second. <laughs> it's not just that, though. Like, this defense is terrible. And if you, to this point, if you have not watched my Ed Donatel... Vic Fangio system video, all of that still applies to the Minnesota Vikings. And they got ran all over against the Green Bay Packers because that is their philosophy. So they have issues. They have legitimate issues, none smaller than losing offensive linemen this week. That's been a big part of their offensive success is the play of that offensive line has been pretty good. And Kirk Cousins is obviously not this crazy play extender. He's definitely a quarterback that needs a baseline of pass protection to be a good player. And you saw it all crumble in this game. You know, Kirk is very uh, textbook. He's very on time. And when that timing is disrupted by quicker, uh, quicker pressure, it all can blow up rather quickly. And they're down now to their third string center. And Brian O'Neill looks like he's done for the year. And I just think that this team, when you remove the record and just look at how good they are, they have been now an underdog against Detroit. They lost. They've been an underdog against the Green Bay Packers. They lost. They were a, th they were only, think about this for a second. They were only a four and a half point favorite at home against the Indianapolis Colts. And they did not cover. They were, um, they didn't cover against the Giants, but they're in. They have Justin Jefferson. They have playmakers defensively. They can still steal playoff wins, but like, do I feel confident that they can even beat the Giants right now in the first round? Hell no. Not with the way that Giants defensive line is playing this time around, going to be against a really injured Vikings offensive line. So I'm still going to put them ahead of them, but that gap is, is narrowing rapidly. And... What's funny is the Vikings now, the winner of the NFC North by a landslide, are going to rank as the third best team in their own division heading into the playoffs. Because the Detroit Lions are going to come in 10th. The Lions steamroll the Bears. Now, very favorable matchup for Detroit, a game that Detroit had to win. Um, the line play there, it's hilarious uh, how big of a difference that is, especially when you look at the you know, the Lions O-line is probably the second best in the league behind the Eagles against the Bears D-line that I said is the worst front seven, and including their linebackers, the worst front seven I've seen in the last decade. Like, it's not a surprise that the Lions paved the way in that game, had whatever they wanted, through the air, through the ground, it didn't matter. Um, they're going to be tested much more uh, against the Packers front this week, but you know, Dan, Dan Campbell kind of said it best. He's like, for us to be playing a meaningful week 18 game or a potentially meaningful week 18 game, like that's what this is all about. And in, in historic Lambeau field, I'm kind of quoting him, but 
for the Lions to walk out of this year, whether they win or lose, whether they make the playoffs, because if they get in, they are a scary team, no doubt. But that seems rather unlikely at this point. Um, because I don't I just don't think the Seahawks lose to the Rams, even if the Lions beat the Packers, which is definitely possible. But for this team that has all the cap space in the world, multiple first round picks, young players, like this team is building something special here. And you can just kind of feel it. And for their season to end this way in a primetime game in Lambeau, like they are going to get up for this game, whether or not they can make the playoffs. So restore the roar. (laughs) Okay. Green Bay Packers at number nine. Y'all laughed at me. Call me names, said I don't know ball. I had at one point ranked them as low as I think 23 at their lowest. They were a bad football team. And I said it. But you could see the second Christian Watson got back into the lineup here, things were turning around for Green Bay. Their offense dramatically shifted in their efficiency. They are now, you know, in the last. If you go back to week 10, when Christian Watson re-entered the lineup, they were a top 10 offense in the league. The other thing is I cannot believe I'm doing this, but I have to give Joe Barry a little bit of credit. He had a great game plan against the Vikes. Press coverage, used Jair, shadowing Justin Jefferson a lot more. Certain times they mixed it up and he wasn't shadowing Justin Jefferson. And that's what it's all about, right? Game plan adaptability. I still don't think he's a good defensive coordinator, but this week, good job. And in the last three weeks, the the Packers defense has played much better. So if they can just be the 20th best defense and a top 10 offense with, you know, it doesn't always feel like a top 10 offense because it's not the Aaron Rodgers led offense that you're used to seeing. But what you get is a really good run game. They're one of the best run teams in the league. You now have a really good offensive line. You know, this has turned around quickly. You've got David Bakhtiari back in there, back from his um, appendectomy. Elton Jenkins now extended as a franchise left guard. Josh Myers has been fine. John Runyon has been one of the best pass-protecting right guards in football. And they now have two options at right tackle in Zach Tom and Yosh Nijman, who as a weakest link, either of those guys you're just fine with. You have a really good O-line, two great running backs, and then you have Rodgers, starting to play much better, who can create explosive plays. So while it's not the Bills' offense, it's not the Chiefs' offense, or the Bengals, or the Eagles, where you're consistently hitting these chunk plays through the air, they're a very good, efficient offense at this point. So I'm just saying that the writing has been on the wall that they are working through some stuff. And right now, if you're these NFC teams... And you had to, if you got to like hand select who you want to play, I think of all the NFC teams behind them, I think your last pick is the Green Bay Packers, if that makes sense. Now they're, they don't have a fear factor about them, but they're, they're a relatively complete football team right now that deserves a lot of credit for the way that they've turned things around. All right. The Jacksonville Jaguars at number eight, they're fascinating to me, man. Their upside is really intriguing. Because when Trevor Lawrence has his games where he's on, he looks like a top eight quarterback in the league. They have really good play calling. They have uh, explosive players, really. And defensively, they're not complete, but they do some fun stuff there. Like the Jags are just kind of this sleeping giant in a lot of ways. And they're probably a year ahead of schedule here. But like when I look at their week one playoff matchup, they're going to be hosting a playoff game, most most likely. We'll, we'll see if they continue to roll and beat the Titans, which I think they will. You know, they're going to host, what, the Chargers or the Ravens? They're potential favorites in that game. Like, they crushed the Chargers early in the year. I think the Chargers are playing better ball right now. But this team definitely has a, like I said, a fear factor about them. Uh, and then we got the Chargers at number seven. And, and this rounds out this tier. It's a big tier. You know, like all these teams are fraudulent one way or another, or at least have holes one way or another. You know, that that F word can be a buzzword that fans don't like. But you know, the Chargers are just they're playing good football. They're getting healthy. They got Bosa back this week. 
These receivers are killing it. Mike Williams looks awesome. Herbert looks awesome with these guys. So the Chargers are definitely fascinating. They're getting back to that kind of team that you, you sort of hope they could be coming into the year. And coming into the year, the, the hope was win a playoff game. And if they can get through this year, seeing the way they've persevered from a mental toughness perspective is impressive for sure. But having Brandon Staley make the types of adjustments that he's made to his scheme to the point where this defense feels more reliable, like heading into next year, it's going to be big time. But they're a team that can make some noise in the playoffs. And I flirted with them being in this next tier of Super Bowl maybes because for the majority of their season, they haven't felt like their upside was quite that much, but we don't fully know what this version of them is with a new Brandon Staley getting like how much can getting Bosa back in the mix really elevate this defense now because I mean, that, obviously that's their best defensive player getting him back could could make this a really scary defense. And yeah, I mean, I, I'm really excited to see January playoff football from the LA Chargers. Sorry, I just beat the shit out of my microphone. Let me fix that. Um, all right. Now we have our fifth tier, the Super Bowl maybes. And I almost just talked myself into moving the Chargers in here. They might even be their own tier there. You could maybe imagine um, that at number seven, but we're going to have the Philadelphia Eagles at number six. And this is all about injuries at their best. When, if, and when they can get all these guys back, I still think they're, they're, uh, you know, the team that earned the number one spot several weeks ago. But since then, Jalen Hurts with a shoulder injury. We don't know his status. You think he's going to be back, but even when he's back, is he 100%? Is he accurate? That's a question mark. But even then, you have Lane Johnson, who they say can get back for the playoffs. That seems a little optimistic, but we'll see. Avante Maddox in the slot. That's been a weakness in this defense now for, for a couple weeks, losing him. Feels like Josiah Scott's getting beat every week. Um, Josh Sweat goes down with a scary neck injury this week. Hopefully he's going to be okay. He was, you know, I know they're deep defensively, but all of a sudden you have to go from Josh Sweat, who's like, I think 12th in the league in pressures. And like, he's been a, he, he was an honorable mention for a top 10 player at the position this year, last week on this channel. You got to go from him now to Robert Quinn, who, let's face it, is a shell of his former self. And Derek Barnett, uh, Barnett's not even out there, um, but that's a drop off. Like, you just you can't take injuries to star players this late in the year and expect to be the best team in football. Now they're still incredibly well coached. They have a ton of depth. They're still a really good football team. Um, but until I see this team get back healthy, I can't put them ahead of these other five teams, uh, including the Dallas Cowboys, who. I'm not going to lie, we're not impressive to me on Thursday night against a practice squad team. That's really what they played. I think this defense continues to show some issues. Um, just they have. They have not met expectations any given week over the last month. I thought they would dominate the Titans, and that was a game until the fourth quarter. Uh, offensively, they're very good, but let's face it, Dak Prescott is turnover prone. He leads the league in interceptions this year despite missing five games. Now, yes, a lot of those have been not his fault. There was another one in this game that was not his fault. Bounces right off his receiver's chest. He has the pick six against the Jags that was not his fault for sure. But he's still, I think, 27th out of 39th in turnover-worthy play percentage. So, yes, he's methodical. Yes, he gets the ball out and has a lot of good to say about Dak Prescott, but like you got to take better care of the football, dude. And I've been saying it really this whole year. Like this January is huge for Dak. He's got to play a consistent stretch. Like he's got to be the quarterback he was in the second half of this game or the second half against the Eagles. He's got to be that quarterback for eight straight halves in the playoffs. And can he do that? Cause you're paying him to do that. So go do it. That's all I'm going to say on deck at this point. It's a show me league. Go show me. Cause he has not to me played like this 
franchise top eight quarterback that everyone says he is. And my biggest point on this is it's not that Dak's a bad quarterback. It's not that they can't win a Super Bowl with him with a great team around him. It's that the way we talk about Derek Carr, Kirk Cousins, Ryan Tannehill as quarterbacks that, yeah, they're fine. Their teams are pretty good with those guys, but eventually their team might want to move on. See the Titans take Malik Willis. The Vikings tried a little bit with Kellen Mond and like, you know, Kirk's kind of bought himself some time here, but we've always talked about that way with Kirk is, you know, he's, he's year to year. Derek Carr, the Raiders are literally moving on from him. To me, that's the group that I see Dak as, but we never talk about him that way. We talk about him like a, a healthy Stafford or even a Justin Herbert, like he is a, a bona fide franchise quarterback. Show me. Show me that that's the case here this January. Um, let's move on to the San Francisco 49ers. And Niners fans are mad that I'm not ranking them one. They're on a great run, but they they showed it's it's tough. Like they get taken to overtime by Jarrett Stidham and the Raiders, and their defense falters a little bit this week. It's strange. I actually feel better about the Niners <laughs> after this week. I, I guess it's not that strange. They end up winning, but. We know this defense is going to play better than that. They just are. Like, this is the best defense in the NFL. It's a reminder that defense can be week to week, though, and that's why having a great offense is more reliable and why those teams tend to get the nod. Um, But that said, this was the best Brock Purdy week. He made some really big plays. He kept going punch for punch, big moments. Now, um... There were some plays in this game. He throws a pick on that game-winning drive. Like, got a little bit lucky. Like, let's just face it. There's a, you know, he tries to throw the ball, getting hit, and it flares up in the air. Feels like maybe a Raiders guy is going to find it. And then Brandon Ayuk up there for it. He's got some magic to him. But, and, and they're still very much Super Bowl contenders. They are the highest-ranking team in the NFC now. So I'm not trying to say they can't do it with Brock Purdy, but I think you're kidding yourselves if you don't have a little bit of hesitation that Brock Purdy can get into playoff football and get this thing done. They do a great job of sheltering the fact that he's a seventh-round rookie with great playmakers and great play calling and a great defense, Um, but they might be a little bit shaky as far as are they a Tier 1 team. I say no, but overall, blown away by the Niners. Then we have our top tier, and this has not changed. It is the Chiefs at three who had another one of these games this week where they do this. The Chiefs have done this for years, and it never really seems to matter, Um, but it's true. Like they, They play down to their competition a lot of the times is really what it feels like, and in these games, it does feel like Mahomes is messing around and Um, He's got the pick at the back corner of the end zone this week. Obviously, you can't make those mistakes in the playoffs. We'll see what happens there, but ultimately, it doesn't matter with the Chiefs because you got Patrick Mahomes, you have playmakers defensively, you have a team that plays with so much confidence, and they just, even when they play down to their competition or they throw a red zone interception that was a stupid mistake, or in this case, they fumble a kick return that sets up the Broncos with an easy touchdown, like, that's a huge swing in this game. Even when they make those stupid mistakes, they make it so that doesn't matter and they still win most of the time. And sure, sometimes you get the Colts game where week two, they don't pull through, but... For the most part, that stuff's going to help them in the Super Bowl uh, or or to get to the Super Bowl because you're going to have close games against the Bills and the Bengals here who I do rank ahead of them. But this is a Tier 1 team, the Kansas City Chiefs, even if their special team is a little shaky and their defense a little shaky. Then the Buffalo Bills at number 2, DeMar Hamlin, get healthy, please, be okay. Um. This is where it's like, I don't even really feel comfortable talking about the game and where these teams are at. It's just weird to me. I can't just, I I can't stop thinking about DeMar in this moment. So these teams ranked two and one last week. The Bengals got off to a good start. Burrow and those receivers looked great. Um, The Bills, I think, were 
prepared to match. Um, so we're, we're going to leave these guys where we had them last week. And we're going to end the show on that note, um, or at least end the power rankings show. Definitely let me know in the comments down below what you guys think uh, about the show this week. And I am going to do a mailbag here before we head down to Chicago and uh, slap that onto the podcast version here. Uh, now we're going to open up the Patreon mailbag. I do want to remind you guys that this podcast is made possible by my amazing supporters on Patreon. We are heading into the new year and draft season, so that means you will get exclusive draft content. You get access to my full draft board with full player write-ups, strengths, weaknesses, grades on all of the individual traits. Uh, you'll get exclusive film breakdowns on Patreon. Once we get into April, you will get exclusive team-specific seven-round mock drafts. So this is the best time of year to sign up. It's a new year, and you can support the channel on patreon.com slash that franchise guy and get access to submit these questions to the mailbag. So let's let's get into it from Keels. With the Jets being in need of a QB, since Wilson looks like a bust, would you either draft a QB or try to get a veteran in the building? Um, he says, I personally think trying to get Gardner Minshew, then draft a prospect. I feel like I've kind of covered this, but I like the veteran route for them. I just I think they're ready. Now you can go, you can go get a car, go get a Derek Carr and or a Jimmy Garoppolo, I think again is a great option because of the schematic familiarity there with LaFleur coming over from San Francisco and the coach knows him. That whole staff is a Niners staff. So that to me is the way they should go, the way they will go. And then sure, you can you can take another flyer, but I think they might still kind of treat Zach Wilson as their prospect. Like, I know he feels like a bust, but to me, that's probably the route they go, unless they're sitting there staring at, like, Anthony Richardson in the draft. But to me, like, I don't think you're moving up for a quarterback if you're the Jets. Maybe you do, but if one falls to you, you might consider it. But I, th I definitely think they go the veteran route. But not, not Gardner Minshew. I mean, Minshew's a backup caliber like, he's a good backup, but you want to get an actual starting caliber guy in there. Uh, from JOR, what do you see Carr getting traded for? We actually kind of talked about this earlier, but I think it, it depends on the team that wants to pull the trigger. But like I said, the teams that are going to be in consideration, you look at Washington, the Jets, maybe the Panthers, those are mid first round picks. I think that's one of those three teams will probably be willing to make that move. I think it's possible it's a second, but no, no lower than a second. I don't think you're getting a damn good pick. You're probably getting a top 50 pick. You might get like a second and a third next year, but like way more than Wentz has gone for in the last couple of years. Right. And Wentz went for a first round pick a couple of years ago. Um, Okay, who are underrated? I love this question, Tyler. I wish I would have prepped this, but we'll we'll do our best. Who are underrated quarterbacks for each of your quarterback traits? So you go arm strength. I think um, Baker Mayfield, honestly, is underrated there. He has an absolute cannon, and, and some people know that, but like seriously, he has one of the seven best arms in the league as far as velocity and distance. Um, decision making, I would say like processing and decision making, um, that one's tougher. Cause I feel like that one we're kind of well aware of like maybe Dak there, but I don't think, I think that's kind of what he gets applauded for. That one's really tough. Uh, maybe Kirk, maybe Kirk cousins for processing and decision making, you go accuracy. I think Herbert's incredibly accurate. Herbert might not get enough credit for how accurate he is as a passer. Him or Burrow, maybe. You go um, pocket presence. Um. 
pocket presence. I don't know if this is the best answer, but what about Mac Jones? I think Mac Jones, going back to the draft, was underrated for his just kind of poise and maneuverability in the pocket. I, I've always liked Mac's pocket presence. What other quarterback traits do we have? Um, athleticism, I guess, could go. That one's usually pretty, pretty much on the forefront. Um, who's like the most sneaky athletic quarterback right now? Um, I mean, Daniel Jones comes to mind. I guess we can give Daniel Jones a shout, even though I feel like people are pretty aware of how fast he is at this point. I love that question, though. Okay, from... Uh, Jamin, when is it time for the Dolphins to stop suffering 8-3 and three to likely 8-9 and nine to end the season as a historic collapse? I don't even know who is to blame. Um, yeah, the suffering is rough, but if you are looking for someone to blame, and, you know, th- this is something, I, let's talk about this. This is something I, I actually wanted to talk about with the DeMar Hamlin situation. But this is kind of an interesting opportunity to talk about this. Uh, one kind of takeaway I had from Monday night, obviously, DeMar, DeMar's health was at the forefront. But um, just the reaction from people is just so disappointing. And this is, you know, Nick Wright said this originally. And if you want to see Nick Wright, he had a great monologue about the whole DeMar Hamlin situation on First Things First. But, like, there isn't always a villain. And... This question just made me think about this. Like, and I'm not, I'm not saying you're doing this, by the way. Um, but it's just it 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 made me think of this earlier. And uh the Dolphins collapse is a much lighter situation, but on a deeper scale, like sometimes shit just happens, and you don't need to point a finger at someone or get angry at someone. Sometimes people just need to. And I understand it's a very loud minority that are doing this stuff. But you see people like blaming T. Higgins or getting mad that the NFL didn't cancel the game immediately. Like, can we just freaking relax? Like, who cares? It was an hour. Like, the hospital, the the ambulance didn't leave the stadium until like 35, 40 minutes after his injury happened. What, are you going to cancel the game and make it impossible for the ambulance to get out of there? So they take 20 minutes after that to communicate with the team and figure out what they want to do. Like, it's not that big a deal that the NFL didn't cancel the game immediately. Like, just everybody just relax. And like, some people are like, oh, it was the vaccine that caused this. Like, you don't freaking know anything about what happened on the field. Like, everybody just relax. You don't have to get mad. Sometimes tragic things just happen. And it's appropriate to just be quiet take things in, internalize things, give things time to rest. Um, And it's just, I hope that things can change, I guess, like just with social media and the way people are in today's society, it's just exhausting. And there's not always an enemy in every situation. And I think that was evidence that in, in the modern world, people are always looking for an enemy. And it's just not always the case. Now, Yaman, Jamin, Jimin, please correct me on how I'm saying your name because I think I butcher it every week. I'm not saying you're doing this. I think it's appropriate in the case of the Dolphins to say whose fault is this because uh, it's just not as serious. And typically in football, there are people to blame. Um, but to me, it is really just about the injuries. Like the Dolphins were killing it, man. I think the front office has done a great job the last couple of years. Mike McDaniel has been incredible. Tua, when he's been healthy, has been, I think, has given it his all. He's been everything he can be. If you want to blame anybody, it it probably is Tua as a whole. Um, not saying it's his fault. A lot of it is he has had limitations as a quarterback. He's had games where he's made big mistakes and it's cost them, but also just like the unfortunate events that he hasn't been able to be available and Teddy hasn't been able to be available. Now that is a very much a durability thing that is a concern with with him and has been, but 
it, it's just injuries for the Dolphins have caught up at the biggest position, quarterback. And uh, that, to me, is where I'd be looking. I think you just hope it improves next year. I think you hope Tua can be healthy. Maybe you do bring in a Jimmy Garoppolo as insurance, which would be a great idea for them. But you hope he can stay healthy. You hope he continues to play better. Like, he has played, what? Don't quote me on this, but 10 games this year. Six of the 10 have been phenomenal. So can you get... 16 games from Tua with 12 incredible games. That's probably the hope for next year. But yeah, it just, it, it was not their year. Um, even though they made some great moves. Uh, from Justin, a lot of these are questions that we kind of talked about already, but, uh, what do the Panthers do at QB this off season? Um, along with some other questions that we kind of talked about already. But, yeah, I think you're in the car market for sure. If you strike out there, you're probably talking about, like, um, bringing Darnold back. Like, that's probably how you play it. I think Derek Carr makes a ton of sense in Carolina. Buys you time to maybe draft a prospect. if you, Because they might not be in a position to draft one of these top quarterbacks at this point. So, it just buys you time to compete and establish a culture in a division that's just not very good. Like, if you bring Derek Carr in and Brady leaves, you by far have the best quarterback in the division. So, like, you're in a pretty good spot to at least make the playoffs if you bring Carr in. And that's why I think it could be a first-round pick. Um, But, like, if you strike out on Carr, you're probably talking about bringing Darnold back on a cheap deal. He's played pretty well. He had some good moments in that Bucks game. You're probably talking about bringing him back. You're you're bringing Corral back into the mix, and then you just kind of see how the draft goes. If you really like an Anthony Richardson, and he's kind of in in striking distance to maybe trade up four spots, maybe you make a move like that. But you're probably just. I don't think you can be like over. Uh, there's no world where they need to or will be over aggressive for a QB, but. They will do something for sure. Um, although I guess bringing Darnold back and seeing what Corral has isn't doing something. But you could be you could be worse off, I guess, than seeing what happens with Darnold and Corral. I would at least be fascinated by it because you're probably not winning a Super Bowl either way. <laughs> it's definitely a definitely a tough conversation that they're having internally. Uh, should the Patriots pay Jacoby Myers and what would be a good contract for him? So they are losing, I believe, Aguilar and Parker. Is Parker still under contract for them next year? I think he is. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he is. But they're losing Aguilar. I think they probably released Jonu Smith. So... I would resign him. He works really well with Mac Jones in the slot there. Yeah, I think that's pretty straightforward. You extend him, he's probably three years 30. I don't think he costs you a fortune, but I think he's important to that team. Uh, oh, you have Kendrick Bourne too, but I think Bourne's on the last year of his deal. You're probably either bringing Bourne or um, Jacoby Myers back. Both those guys are fairly redundant. But I think if you if you remove one, the other is going to succeed more. So I guess whatever makes more sense there, it's one or the other, but probably uh, Jacoby Myers. He's the homegrown talent and uh, younger. Okay, last question here. If the Bengals find magic again and go back-to-back Super Bowl and Burrow has an elite playoff run, is there possibly a debate for who QB1 is between him and Mahomes? Possibly. Possibly. It depends how Mahomes plays and how Burrow plays. Like, I, I want to see Burrow secure QB2 first, and then we can have the QB1 debate. But, I mean, Mahomes has been pretty damn special this year, really. So, uh, I'm not going to rule it out. Love Joe Burrow. But uh, that might be a little bit ahead of ahead of schedule. But it's it's not, not impossible. So, 
There we go. Thank you for your questions, Patreon. Thank you for listening. Uh, fun show this week, despite the circumstance. Uh, was was nice to kind of combine, um, you know, the power rankings into the show. I don't know if that's a formula for for next year or not. Um, probably not, because we we spent forever <laughs> this week because it was a podcast hybrid on the power rankings. Um, but either way, thank you for listening to the Fully Inflated Football Podcast and. We'll see you guys uh, next Monday for playoff predictions on YouTube. Peace out.